Hello and welcome to the New York Jewish Film Festival. My name is Aviva Weintraub and I'm the director of the festival. The festival is co-presented every year in January by the Jewish Museum and Film at Lincoln Center. And we're thrilled this year to be featuring the film, The Narrow Bridge by Esther Tekach. And I'm delighted that Esther is joining us for a Q&A from Melbourne, Australia. Welcome, Esther. <laughs> Hi, Aviva. Lovely to be with you. Thank you. So just to give our audience some background, uh, you are a child and adult psychologist who has taken the dive into the world of filmmaking. Yes. Uh, you've worked mm -hmm. for a number of hospitals, and now you have your own private practice. And That's building right. on your experience in psychology, you're also an award-winning author of three books that span genres from fiction to nonfiction. And your book, Genesis, the book with 70 faces, won the National Jewish Book Award. I'm really excited that we're showing your film, The Narrow Bridge. It's so powerful. Um, so I'd like to start off by asking you, how did you come to make this film? Okay, well, as you said, I'm a child and adult psychologist in my day job. I actually studied psychology, did my master's in, in psychology at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and lived and worked in Jerusalem for eight years and had to return to Australia for family reasons. But I've remained very connected to Israel and I wanted to express that in some sort of practical way. So over the last 11 years, I've been going and working as an honorary psychologist a month a year in the pediatric department at Hadassah Hospital. And I don't know how much you or people there know about Hadassah Hospital and many hospitals in Israel, but about 50% of the patient body come from the Israeli Arab or Palestinian sector. So for me, it was this fascinating experience working with Israeli and Palestinian children and their families. And also a lot of the staff come from you know, a range of backgrounds. And um, it was during my time working there that I, oh, well, I guess through that work, I really saw firsthand the effects of the ongoing conflict and how fear and hate can grow on both sides. But I also saw what happens when an Israeli Jewish boy shares a room with a Muslim Palestinian boy, which is a daily occurrence. They, they don't, they're kind of um, conflict, intentionally conflict blind in the hospital. And I've seen how in that shared intimacy of sickness and vulnerability, people really do get to know each other in a different way as human beings and different relation and relationships develop differently. So if you're a mom of a little boy and the other boy's vomiting, you know, you can go, go and get the bucket no matter where they come from sort of thing. So and it was during my time there, I also got to know the four participants in the film um, because I saw like just like sickness kind of levels people and brings them down to the same experience um, to into life's essentials. Grief is the same. So when I was working there one year, about five years ago, I went with a friend for the first time to the Israeli-Palestinian memorial ceremony for victims of the conflict. It was something I'd heard about, but I'd never been. And I'm very aware that holding that ceremony on Erev Yom Azikaron, which is when it's held, is difficult for many people. In fact, in the film, Meital says, talks about how Yom Azikaron is such a sacred day in the Israeli calendar. And I really understand that people want to be able to remember their loved ones and to have to remember the loved ones, have to on the other side at the same time is very emotionally challenging and confronting. So many Israelis see this kind of joint ceremony as a disloyalty to those who fell defending the country. And when I went there, it was very intense because um, that time the ceremony was held indoors in a stadium and you literally walked through protesters yelling at you and cursing you on either side. Um, but once you get inside the ceremony, it's this completely different um, atmosphere. And it's really this amazing, I found it, amazing place of poetry and prayer where you hear um, bereaved Palestinians and Israelis telling their stories 
about their child or their parent or their sister or their brother who were who have been killed in the conflict and they're really sharing their pain with a resolve that other people are spared this terrible grief and with the determination that the conflict must end. And one of the people I heard speak was David Grossman, who's one of my all-time favourite authors, who lost his, his son. And um, I'm going to just quote what he said, which is, he said, I know that within the pain there is also breath and doing good, that grief does not isolate but also connects and strengthens. Here old enemies, Israelis and Palestinians, can connect with each other out of grief and even because of it. So really during that ceremony, you sense the possibility of a different future for Israel, you, you know, something that was respectful and um, you felt this kind of the sense, the, the pain involved in a change of heart, a sense of hope and healing. And I was incredibly blown away. And already at that time, I saw these people as important for Israel and Palestine, but also as a model for people in conflict and dealing with trauma across the world. But I somehow realised that very seemed like few people, especially outside Israel and Palestinian territories, know about these stories and they need a bigger voice and that's why I made the film, really. That's how I came to make the film and I just I dove into it. <laughs> it it's wonderful. It, it's clear, you know, as a viewer of the film that you bring a really special perspective um, to... The, to the experience of talking to these these really fascinating people how how did you um it sounds like you meet many many interesting people in this context how did you narrow it down to these four I was very lucky Aviva uh, <laughs> um I really was because I understand that the quality of the main participants you choose for a documentary, is really going to, you know, determine the story and the quality of how those people come across on screen and all of that's really important. And I was just learning, and this is my first documentary. And um, um, Bassam and Rami were at that time the, Israel the Palestinian and the Israelis co-director of the Israeli-Palestinian Bereaved Families Organisation. So I was recommended them. And then I spoke to some other people within the organization and they recommended Maytal. Maytal was actually the first interview I did. I was literally in an Airbnb in Tel Aviv um, and had a young um, film cinematographer come and we filmed Maytal and she gave this amazing interview. And from then I knew I had gold, really. It was beautiful. So, and then Bushra, I was also recommended. And in a way, Bushra's, I love her as a as a character, as a person, but she's the one I can have the least direct contact with because I don't speak Arabic. She doesn't speak Hebrew or English, so there always has to be a translator there. Um, but she's also amazing. Um, so I was just incredibly lucky, really. <laughs> yeah, and we'll, we might talk about this a little bit later. I don't know when. To, well, I might say it now, actually, but... So I was working on the film from 2017 um, with these four people. Um, and then suddenly in 2020, um, Colin McCann comes out with his book, A Paragon, which is a beautiful book, an amazing work of art, of writing. But I was shocked because it tells the story of Rami and Bassam and I had no idea this was happening and he was working on it. And in the beginning, I was a bit flawed. It was like, oh, he's just told, he's telling the story of the two two of the people in my film that might make my film irrelevant now. Um, and it turned out we were both working on our projects at the same time and we didn't know about each other. I think Rami did know about both of us, but he didn't tell. Um, and then after going through this kind of shock that a Paragon follows the stories of Rami and Bassam, I actually realised and I know very little about PR and marketing and all of that, but I did realise that this could be good for the film because the book's done so well, people will want to see the men in the book in a film. And then the next amazing thing that happened, 
uh, which was also kind of scary, was that Steven Spielberg bought the film rights to a Paragon. So here am I making my little low-budget documentary uh, that still Spielberg's meant to be coming out with a feature film about two of the characters sometime in the future. Yeah. <laughs> well, more interest is more interest. I think that's great. Yeah. Um, so as a trauma psychologist, how, how do you account for the way these really special individuals in the film have processed their trauma and how they respond to it? Right, yes. Well, I guess I know from my work that people really change after deep trauma and loss, that trauma can change your body and your mind and your spirit. And truly, as a psychologist, it was amazing to hear the participants describe almost some of the textbook um, symptoms of trauma and PTSD. Um, so we hear Bushra describe the effect on her body and her spirit when she says, my body fell apart. I lost interest in everything. I didn't care about my other children. And Maytal tells how her sense of shock um, and loss was so overwhelming and her father was killed in that very brutal way. She describes how at her dad's funeral she felt a screen go down and afterwards she couldn't feel anything, which is quite an amazing visceral description of disassociation. But some says, you know, sometimes you think you're going to die from this sadness. Mm -hmm. um, we also know that trauma often pay, makes people in what in psychological language is called like hyper aroused and overactive and uh, overreactive and irritable and angry. And Maytel says, you know, what are you going to do with this anger that eats you inside? And we know that living with ongoing conflict causes trauma, but trauma increases conflict because people are hyper aroused. And in Israel and the Palestinian territories, I've read that up to 30% of people suffer from PTSD with much higher numbers in specific conflict areas, you know, around Gaza and there. So it is amazing that Meital, Bushra, Romeo and Bassam not only overcame this anger, this despair, this dis depression, they went on to develop strengths they never had before and became these powerful activists for conflict resolutions. So I've seen how people's stories of trauma have this kind of arc. There's a before, who I was before. There's a during, what happened to me during. And there's an after, how am I changed, who am I now? And that's part of what drove me through the film. It's like I set out on this journey to understand how they changed. And as I listened to the interviews, these common themes kept emerging again and again. And one of them was this experience that they each had of meeting the human face of their enemy. So I know that since the separation wall has been built, and I know obviously have been spending time in Israel for, you know, 35 years or so, um, since that wall has been built, which does reduce terror attacks, it does mean that Israelis and Palestinians don't see each other in their common humanity at all, really. So Palestinians' most common contact is with, is, is with Israelis is as soldiers and settlers. And Israelis often see Palestinians as these kind of uncompromising, violent people who are willing to send their children to die and kill others. So they really don't see each other having a family picnic or looking after their children or their elderly. Um, but after their losses, each of the four people in the film came to see the human face of the other and saw and understood the pain of the other, often for the first time, and it changed them. So I think that was one of the processes. The other thing that I saw was that there was this shift in identity. So we all have multiple identities. You know, I'm a Jewish Australian, mother of three sons, vegetarian, for example. <laughs> but in Israel and Palestine, identity is largely along national and religious lines. You know, I'm a Muslim Palestinian. But after their loss, and the loss was such a strong experience, the identities of the, these people changed. They all were all now bereaved people, um, not simply a Muslim Palestinian, but a bereaved mother. And Bushra is the one who says in the film, it's the same pain, the same wound. So this becomes this kind of um, connecting identity. 
that I think brought them together. And, and the third thing I want to say here is that there is over the last two decades or so recent research about this phenomenon of post-traumatic growth, how some people after trauma can show a change in beliefs, a renewed sense of purpose and appreciation for life, a newfound sense of their own strengths mm -hmm. that allowed them to do different things. And when I saw Maital, Basam, Rami and Bushra do things like lead demonstrations against violence, talk to Palestinian and Israeli high school students, donate blood to each other. I became convinced that each of them shows this post-traumatic growth, growth and that's kind of part of what drives them. And again, bushra has got a great quote that she says, um, I started believing in myself that I'm a strong wo woman with the self-esteem and courage to face life with all its beauty and challenges. And she's somebody who changed from a young, a woman who married at 14 and had children and hardly left her village to somebody who's, who flies across the world speaking publicly. You know, it's an amazing transformation. So, you know, this idea that trauma can be a very powerful changing experience. There's an international trauma ex expert, Peter Levine, I think he's based in the States, remember, who says the paradox of trauma is that it has the power to destroy and the power to transform. Um, but there's another element here, which is their stories are not just personal, there's a, a social aspect. There's, And I think there's a significant interaction between their social activism and their personal recovery because they all belong to this organisation, Israeli-Palestinian Bereaved Families, which I think really helps people recover. It provides a sense of community. It allows their trauma to be witnessed and it allows that pain to be transformed into some sort of meaning. So I think, you know, kind of all those things together. I mean, there's one other interesting psychology thing that I kind of read and gleaned, which is there's a professor of psychology at Stanford University, Jamil Zaki, who's done research about empathy and how suffering shifts empathy. And when people cause it, their empathy erodes. But when people experience, their empathy grows. So I think that's also really interesting to understand part of what happened with these people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what kind of impact do you think these organizations can have, like the Bereaved Families Organization? What kind of can they affect change? Um, I... That, I, I really think they can. That was something I learned about through the making of the film. Uh, I learned about the significance of people-to-people -people grassroots peace-building projects and organisations. In some ways, it's easy to be a bit cynical about them, you know. So what does it matter if, you know, the, so three Palestinian women go and meet three other Palestinian women or something? But no, I, I really saw that they can create significant change. So just a spe specific examples for the film, Bushra was somebody who said she never wanted to meet the Jews who killed the who killed her son. She was invited to come along to the organization. We see that in the film. She said, I don't want to go, I don't want to meet those Jews. It's only after she meets a Jewish Israeli woman, Robbie, whose son had died, that she she changes and um, that face-to-face -face meeting changes her and she becomes involved in the organisation and becomes a peace activist herself. So there are lots of individual examples about that, oh, like um, Rami and Bassam. Rami, a father of the Holocaust survivor, Bassam grew up in a village near Hebron and grew up hearing that the Holocaust is a big lie, you know, didn't really know much about it. And... Um, later, he ends up spending time in an Israeli jail. It's in the film. And um, he, by chance, watches a film about the Holocaust in jail and learns about it and then goes on to um, actually do a master in Holocaust studies. Mm -hmm. And he, um, But through meeting Rum in his family, he now, every Yom HaShoah, when that siren blares in Israel, Bassam gets up and stands a minute silence in memory of the victims and 
in respect of Rummy's father. So that's the way those kind of personal connections can change. But on a bigger level, um, I've learned, uh, so I've seen, sorry, I've seen with the organisation how dialogue workshops and talks with high school students break down stereotypes and reduce fear and mistrust. And that ceremony that I've gone to kind of really decreases each side's experience that they're the exclusive victim. Um, I know that their projects have got researched and it was shown that participants had a like 80% shift in their, in their positive attitude towards the conflict and understanding of the other. But in a general sense, I've learned that um, you can't just have top-down political solutions to conflict in many ways. That's what was tried in Oslo and Oslo failed because there wasn't readiness on the ground, both in Israeli and Palestinian communities. You need to also have bottom-up grassroots change to change the conflict of culture on the ground. And that's what these kind of organisations do. And that's what we've seen in other situations of conflict across the world, in South Africa and Northern Ireland and in Central America. There's been this approach called transitional justice, which is a hybrid of human rights law and conflict resolution that's about this kind of grassroots change that has to come from the bottom up. Mm. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> yes, yes, that was great. Really interesting. Um, what what were some of the challenges you faced in making the film? <laughs> okay. Um, so just having a cup of coffee. <laughs> um, okay. There were a lot of challenges. Um, um, one of the big challenges is I had no money. <laughs> so when I started off making the film, my husband was in Israel. I rang him and I said, well, I'm going to make this film. And we said, okay, we're happy to put um, X amount into it ourselves. Uh, in the beginning, I thought it would be a 20-minute film. It grew. I realised that if I was seriously going to follow these four people's stories, it was going to be a longer film. It took a long time to raise money for the film and for a lot of the time I was doing it on a shoestring budget and we were funding it ourselves. But things did come together. I had to do a crowdfunding campaign, which is very outside my comfort zone. I had to get out, step outside my comfort zone a lot. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk more about the kind of theoretical challenges. So one was really a challenge about being a psychologist making a film like this because I'm aware that it's complicated and difficult interviewing people about such traumatic events. Um, I wanted to have real and personal and authentic conversations with them. I didn't want it to be a PR tape that they've told lots of times. But at the same time, I didn't want to re-traumatise them. I didn't want to exploit their pain. Um, so that's something I was aware of. And uh, there was a sense almost of a conflict between the, being a really good filmmaker and being a psychologist. So there was one time when Rami told me that he, and it's in the film a bit, he wakes up, he still wakes up at night sweating from memories from his experiences in the Yom Kippur War. And as a psychologist, I wanted to stop and talk him through that and think what, what ideas we could think of so he doesn't have nightmares at night. So there was this kind of... Um, this conflict, you know, I was aware that I'm asking people to revisit their pain and that's a hard thing to do, but I was also aware that they'd made this decision to really harness their pain for this work and I was aware that telling their story did give a sense of meaning. So that was one area of challenge. The other area was it was really important to get the right balance. I, you know, I didn't want to be seen as a Jewish outsider not having the right balance here. And in in some ways I had an insider-outsider perspective in the film. I spent a lot of time in Israel. I speak Hebrew, a little bit of Arabic, um, but I know the issues, so that was all good. Um, but uh, it was important, to, obviously, to get, I want to have a man and a woman from both sides. I used both Israeli and Palestinian cinematographers. Um, yeah. So I was really pleased I've been in contact with um, somebody from the US Institute of Peace who 
And she saw the film and she said, you manage the almost impossible in the context of covering this conflict balance. So, and, and I know Palestinians who've watched the film are, are comfortable, the ones I've spoken to are comfortable with it. So that's, that was an important thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there were lots of little challenges along the way when my amazing Palestinian cinematographer got COVID. This was happening during COVID time when I had to pick up Bassam for filming from a checkpoint, but that checkpoint didn't appear on any map, on any Google map, and the cinematographer and I were driving around and we were waiting at a checkpoint and we waited and waited and we would not end up not being at the wrong checkpoint. <laughs> so, you know, these kind of funny things as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and where does the title come from? What is the meaning of the title, The Narrow Bridge? Right. Um, okay. Well, the Narrow Bridge title really resonates in a number of ways. Um, uh, these bereaved Israelis and Palestinians are building a bridge between their societies, a bridge of understanding and compassion. Um, but as well as this kind of cross-community bridge, I feel like they've also crossed this internal bridge in their own journeys from grief to activism from trauma to post-traumatic growth and they've stepped way out of their comfort zones to build both their bridges in many ways and Bassam says in the film this is how to use your pain to build a bridge between people. Now of course I knew of Reb, I know the song and I knew of Reb Nachman's words about the narrow bridge called Haolam Kulo Gesher Tsar Me'od you know, the whole world is a narrow bridge, but we must not be afraid, which I think is what they're doing. They're overcoming their fear to walk on this bridge. But I was delighted to find that there is a similar concept in Islamic culture, that every person must cross the narrow bridge on Judgment Day. Um, and I understood that to mean a narrow bridge of did we lead a moral and ethical life? Did we re lead the right life? The right life, sorry. So, yeah, I feel like it is a resonant title. Absolutely. Um, you've described the film as an impact documentary. What, what do you mean by that? Right, okay. Well, I guess um, when I set out to make the film, it wasn't, it was never kind of, simply entertainment um, and it was I was trying to make the best film I could but I was learning but I really wanted to make the film from the beginning to get the message of these people out there I wanted to um, people to become more aware of these people's stories um, so I want to um, uh, create change around issues of trauma and conflict resolution. So um, I'm building um, resources and a program on one area so that professionals working with traumatised people can use the film as a therapeutic tool to show how people can go through trauma and come out with these strengths, but also so that organisations working with conflict can use the film as a tool for facilitating change and an example of conflict resolution. So um, we've got partnerships with a range of international organisations and um, are working on um, a program for that. Actually, in, two, in 2020, um, there was a, a special grant made for funding to develop more of these grassroots people-to-people peace-buildings projects in Israel and the Palestinian territories. It's called the Nita M. Lowy Middle East Partnership for Peace Act. It's the MEPA grant. And um, so I think it's really a through this Lowy Foundation, I haven't researched who that person is, but obviously a very generous person, um, and has given $250 million of funding that's administered through the U.S. Institute of Aid, USAID. That's great. Um, I have one, one last question. Uh, ultimately, what, what do you feel that you learned from the people in the film? <laughs> I feel like I learned a lot from them. Um, 
I learned how even after devastating loss, it's people it's possible for people to hear and understand the other and what an enormous difference that makes. Um, I heard, I learned how uh, terrible pain changes you, but that sometimes you can find strengths you never had before. Um, and I learned that um, important stuff about grassroots people to people peace building projects. Um, but in a nutshell, I met Metal one time for breakfast in Jerusalem and she asked me what I learnt working on the film. And I know I remember I got quite teary kind of when I said it and I said that, you know, I, I learned that there were people who could take us out of the violence and the pain of the conflict, people who've gone through devastating loss and through that pain have gained understanding and insight and the ability to compromise. So I saw that. And I said, I hope if only we can listen to them, but I'm worried we're not listening. Mm. <laughs> so I, I learned that if these people could be the leaders, they could sort it out, you know, and that's the sad thing. You know, there are people who, there are people who will could be partners on both sides and could lead their peoples forward but I don't think they're getting the um, air space and I don't think they have the power to do that. And well, I'm, worried, I'm worried that particularly with the current incoming very right-wing government, their work is going to be even harder. Well, so, thank you for bringing their voices forward. It's such a such a powerful film. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for the film and thank you for discussing it with me. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for choosing to screen it at the New York Jewish Film Festival. It's an enormous buzz and honour. <laughs>